After looking at the glory of Jesus, to at least reflect on what difference this ought to make in us, because it should, and it does. We want to welcome you to the last in our series on the glory of God. We hope you've benefited from Scott's look into what does Jesus want most for us? What is God's glory? Where do we see it? How do we see it? And finally, on today's episode, what difference does seeing God's glory make? If you've not had the chance to listen to the other episodes, we'd encourage you to go back or even re-listen as our hope and prayer is that through this series, you would gain new or fresh insight into the true and ultimate goal of Christian faith, which is to enjoy life forever with a clear and eternal vision of the awesome glory of God revealed through Jesus. We've been looking at this, this incredibly in some ways, terrifying topic of the glory of God. Because there's no way we're going to adequately present. It's almost frightening for me to stand here for fear of not adequately presenting or addressing or speaking to such a topic as this. But at the same time, if we don't try, then we're not being obedient in in seeking God out in his word. I think I shared with you a story at the beginning of the week when I was in my 20s and about entering seminary, and my grandfather, who was an old-timey pastor, and and he asked me this question uh, when I was going into seminary. He said, "Uh, you're a Christian, are you? Yes, of course, you know that, Grandpa. I've been a Christian all my life. He said... And he asked me that question, well, then tell me, who is God? You say you know God, who is he? And, and I would say that, that, you know, God works differently in all of our lives, I think, to direct us and grow us in the direction he wants us to. But I really see this week as just one, it's one more continuation, one more step And I think the journey that God started from that single question back then, and I'm not going to leave here today feeling like I've adequately answered it. It's just, it's like I've been on this journey to know God, which is eternal life, Jesus said. And so I guess my hope this week has been, uh, you won't leave here with a degree or a certificate in anything but, but hopefully that God will use this as one more step in the, in the ultimate trajectory of your life in Christ, which is to know him. So in humility, then, that's what I, my prayer is for this morning. Uh, we've been looking at the glory of Jesus, and I won't review everything we've talked about this week because we've done that enough. But I thought that to close off the week, it would be fitting, after looking at the glory of Jesus, to at least reflect on what difference this ought to make in us, because it should, and it does. It makes all the difference, I would argue. And to do that, I just want to step backwards to a passage we've been looking at, and we've been looking at some key texts that I hope this week has familiarized, helped familiarize you with. Of course, Exodus 33, 30, uh, 34 is, is a big one, really serving as the launch pad for what I see as all future developments of a discussion of the glory of God, specifically the Apostle Paul, and specifically the other major passage addressing the glory of God and the glory of Jesus, which is 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. There are others as well, not to mention, perhaps least of all, the, the greatest passage we leapt out of from Sunday, which is Jesus' prayer to his Father in John 17. I just hope those have become more familiar, more familiar turf for you to walk through as you, you know, as you spend time in Scripture and knowing God through his word. But in answering this question, what, what difference do we see? What difference does seeing Jesus' glory make? I want to go back to Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 3.18, which we did look at earlier on. And we know in this passage that Paul's leaning heavily on the imagery, the event from Moses' encounter with God on the mountain, Exodus 33 and 34, and God's display of his glory to Moses. And what would come after that, and we looked a couple days ago at a comparison, what Paul was doing was using that as a, a template for comparison 
Not that that was not an event of God's glory. Absolutely it was. But he's comparing that event with now the revelation of God's glory in Christ, the old covenant glory and the new. And and Paul's conclusion is there's no comparison in terms of the superiority of the revelation of God's glory in Christ versus that in Moses. And he talks in particular about the veiling. And he says, uh, you know, obviously for the Israelites, they, they put a veil on Moses' face. But we with, all, with unveiled faces, he's talking now about the church, about those in Christ, looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So, so here's the picture that Paul's leaning on. We remember Moses in the wilderness, and Moses would go into God's presence, whether it was when he initially he went up the mountain for that great mountaintop glory experience, and he came back down, and the Israelites said, Moses, whoa, your face is glowing. The residual, I suppose, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming this was some kind of light experience, a visual, visible uh, illumination of Moses' face, And the Israelites couldn't stand to look at it. And maybe in a little bit we'll understand more why. So they said, Moses, put a a bag over your head. (laughs) Put a veil over your head, Moses, because we can't stand to look at it. And so Moses came down and he put a veil over his face. And then when he would go back to the tent of meeting to meet with the Lord, he'd go back in the tent and the cloud would descend and God would meet with Moses face to face and he'd come back again and his face would be aglow and back on would go the bag. And this would just go over and over again. And that's what Paul's referring to, right? This veil. They could not see, but, but he then elucidates that example by saying it wasn't just that they couldn't visibly see it, they couldn't visibly look at it. He said, but a veil, even to this day, he said, a veil remains over their minds whenever the Old Covenant is read. So it was more than just a visible issue. It was an issue of the heart. But Moses, or Paul is then saying, now, for those of us in Christ, we all, with unveiled faces, so for us, the veil is lifted, that which, that which covered or concealed the reflection or the radiance of God's glory, that's been removed for us now in Christ. With unveiled faces, we who now looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord. And your, your Bible might say we contemplating the glory of the Lord. But the verb there actually, uh, in, it actually just occurs this one time in Greek and I so I thought, oh, I'm going to look this up. And sure enough, it, it, it has everything to do with a mirror, the Greek word that he uses. It's just refle- a mirror's reflection. So I think, the, I think the New American Standard has it right in saying, looking or beholding as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord. So our faces are unveiled. We behold God's glory. And Paul says then, we who as in a mirror are looking at beholding God's glory are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So we are then now beholding God's glory and now we are reflecting God's glory. And the, and the question I have is this, so, so how does that work exactly? I'm really interested, I have been for some time, interested in the, the causation. Specifically, uh, thinking of 1 John 3, 2, where, where John says, What we will become has not yet been made apparent. But when we see him, we will be like him. Like, okay, so a change is going to happen. And then Paul or and John says, for, there's the causative word, for we shall see him as he is. And I've in some of my notes earlier on, I remember writing down, what's the causative agent? What's the What's the causation between seeing and reflecting is kind of what I'm curious to understand. So my question is, how does beholding Jesus' glory result in our reflecting Jesus' glory? And I think Paul tells us, but we all with unveiled faces looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord 
are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, Paul says, just as or as from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so what Paul's saying is that this reflecting, this transforming from glory to glory, this is from the Lord. It's the Lord Jesus who's doing this. The Lord Jesus, the Lord who is the Spirit, Paul says. And of course, here we delve into the mystery of the Trinity. Right? So it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of Jesus who is doing this transforming work. So we behold Jesus' glory contained within the gospel, and then Jesus transforms us. Is, is that how it works? So, so therefore, it's this. here's the cause effect. We look at the glory of Jesus in the gospel, and then Jesus transforms us. Is that how it's working? And I don't think that's quite it. I don't think that's quite it. And here's why I don't think that that's quite it. I don't think that just simply the beholding is the causative, is the causative for reflecting. I don't think it's just that the act of beholding results in or produces reflecting. I think there's something else going on. And here's why I think that. Remember we talked about this earlier in the week. So, so that two people could look into the truth of the gospel. Two people could look at the same thing and see in the gospel, the gospel which is the revelation of of the glory of God in the face of Jesus, right? The gospel of Jesus' glory, who is himself the image of God, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Two people can look at the same thing, and yet their reactions can be completely different. One can say, huh, look, look how glorious Jesus is, while the other is unmoved and befuddled. Eh, I guess Jesus was a good teacher, I suppose. Why is that? Uh, Why can one look and see, truly behold the glory of Jesus, and another look at the the same gospel truth, the same gospel, and, and see nothing? And I think, again, it comes back to what Paul points at in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. What I think is that our very capacity to behold the glory of Jesus revealed in the gospel is the indicator that God has already transformed us. If you are beholding the glory of Jesus and you see the glory of Jesus in the gospel and you say, look at Jesus, look how wonderful he is, you're already reflecting his glory. Because by seeing it and responding to it, you are showing evidence that his glory is is reflecting from you. Your response in seeing the beauty and the wonder and the excellence of Jesus, that's the indication that the glory of Jesus is on display. And to me, this makes total sense. It takes total sense when you consider what the heart of sin is. Going back in Paul, in Paul in chapter, Romans chapter 1, which is another really foundational text for understanding the gospel of glory, uh, where Paul unpacks the human condition in Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. He goes on to discuss, he says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. And his... Paul has in mind all of humanity, but I believe in this text he's specifically using as an illustrative means, illustrating all of humanity or representing. He's talking specifically about Adam and Eve as our representatives, right? They neither 
glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, remember at the tree, what was, what was it that tempted them at the tree? What was Satan's temptation? If you eat of it, what will you become? It will make you wise. You will become like God. The very thing that they should desire, to become wise and to become like God. Because after all, weren't they created to bear his image? To reflect his glory? Although they claimed to be wise, however, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. You see, what they sought was to gain the glory of God by giving that glory to the creation and pursuing it for themselves. No wonder their hearts became darkened and their minds futile in their thinking. Because they believed that, or they accepted that, or they embraced the idea that the glory of God is not what is ultimately glorious, but rather his creation in itself. And so the very thing that God created to reflect his glory, humanity turned into an end in and of itself. Humanity turned into God's glory. That's the essence of sin, this this exchange in glory. And so how could we who have embraced that, how could we who have made this exchange in glory ever get ourselves out of this mess? We could never ever think our way out. We could never ever conjure the desire for God's glory on our own, having already made this exchange. The the contrast could not be more absolute. The difference between having having descended into the darkness of sin, having embraced and imbibed the lie that the creation itself could become the glory that belongs to the creator alone. The, the, The difference could not be more stark and opposite. And so humanity's heart was darkened in sin, exchanging the glory of God for the lie that the creation itself could have that glory. And it just ended in a a downward spiral. And this is where, apart from Christ, all of us are caught. It's not that because of sin we all become as wicked and evil as we could be. I mean, we know that by God's common grace, by his good grace, People apart from Christ, there are still good people in the world who do good things. The point, however, is that the eyes of their heart can never seek out or look for or desire that which is truly glorious, which is God himself. Their focus will just continue in one direction— to try and find the fullness, the fulfillment, the satisfaction that can only be supplied by God in his creation. And it's a, a hopeless, futile endeavor that ultimately ends in death. But in Christ, the veil is lifted not because we suddenly turn and see how glorious the glory of Jesus is, but because God himself gives to us eyes with which to see. He, by his spirit, illuminates us, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. He gives us, he enlightens us, he he gives life to us so that we can see, so that we can behold Jesus' glory. And as a result, we, we should see some distinct changes then in, in the, the affections of our heart and the trajectory of our lives and the things that we count truly valuable. We should experience a growing desire for holiness. 
simply as a consequence of having now seen the glory of God in Jesus. In seeing how beautiful and desirable Jesus is, there should be this natural response of wanting to be like him. We should experience a growing desire in our affection and attraction to Jesus. We should experience a decrease in the attractiveness and the allurement of this world. Coupled with a a growing contentment. And these things ought to happen not, not as a result of our own efforts, although our effort is involved, but as a natural consequence of having our eyes fixed more and more on Jesus' glory. And I found in my own faith walk, I have found this to be true, but I say that in, in, in full admission, that that doesn't mean I've, I've got it all figured out or that I'm doing it right every time. But like you, I still wrestle with that old sin nature. But I have discovered this to be true. It used to be my approach to, to you know, working through and trying to, to shed myself or, 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 or sanctify myself from the old sins. I would set up disciplines, and these are good things. Disciplines are great things. But my focus would be on trying hard not to do those sins anymore. Have you ever tried really hard to not think about something? What happens? <laughs> you end up thinking about it even more. And I, and I say this to my kids and I, and I say this to myself by experience. The only way to stop thinking about one thing is to begin thinking about another. And so what I've discovered in, in practice, although I wish I'd perfected it, and that's a part of, I think, something else that goes along with, now the consequence of, of seeing Jesus' glory, is that the only way to stop focusing on sin is to find something else to focus on. And what I have found is that the more I, I focus on the glory of Jesus as my goal, as that which is truly desirable, as I move down that road, consequently, I find that the things I used to be attracted to aren't as attractive. So it's not by trying to not be attracted to them, but it's by looking to that which is truly beautiful and desirable, that which ought to truly captivate my heart, which is Jesus. It's not something I've completely figured out yet, but I've discovered from God's word that, that this is the case, to be free from sin, that a, a natural consequence of looking upon Jesus' glory is a desire to be more holy, a, a greater awareness of our sinfulness. And that's the other part of the rub I'm finding. I'm almost 50 years, almost 40 plus years now as a Christian. And as I continue to seek to follow after Jesus, and I think I'm making progress along the way, but I'll tell you something that does happen. The, the, the closer I draw to Jesus, and this might be part of the struggle we have, is that the greater and more clear Jesus' glory and beauty and perfection becomes, the more I see it, the more I become really conscious of just how sinful I am. I told this to my pastor the other day, and he encouraged me by saying, you know what, Scott, that's actually a sign of maturity. I see just how sinful my sin is. And I suppose in part that makes me sad. But it also makes me grateful all the more that Christ has saved me from it. These are just some of the realities, some of the, the consequences I've experienced myself and I'm still learning, but also have discovered from Scripture is the difference that seeing Jesus' glory makes, it truly does change us. It completely changes the affections we have, what we consider valuable in the world. We ought to see our grip of the things of this world lessen and lessen. And I think that's a good, you know, Paul and Peter both said, test yourself to see whether you're in the faith. How tightly do you cling to the things that you have? 
if there are things that you see in your life that, you, you know, they're a high priority, these things, that if you lost them, somehow you'd be devastated, test yourself. Because as we find our greater worth and prize and goal in Jesus and his glory, as the, as the hymn goes, the things of this earth ought not seem that valuable anymore. And I think that ought to become more and more the case. And one of the reasons I think that is true is because the gospel and the rewards of the gospel and, and the riches of the gospel, of the glory of Jesus, are true for everyone, no matter where you are around the world. And one of my theology professors used to say to me, he said, the gospel, if the gospel is true, it has to be equally true for those of us living in middle class, upper middle class comfort in Canada, and the person who's starving on the other side of the world in some war-torn country. That the riches and the reward and the contentment of the gospel ought to be the same. Because those riches are ultimately Jesus himself. So that I don't need the things that this world offers to have that contentment. And, you know, I take that from the Apostle Paul. And maybe this is a good place to go to kind of land this plane. But Paul in Philippians chapter 3, his words here... I think are reflective of the kinds of change we ought to see, the kind of global change we ought to see in our affections as a consequence of now having tasted, as the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good, right? Of now, through the Holy Spirit, being given the capacity to see and appreciate and taste the beauty and the wonder of the glory of Jesus, the consequent ought to be, as as Paul now evaluates in his own life, he says, whatever was for my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss compared to that surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. For whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish. They're trash. They're nothing. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and of sharing in his sufferings, somehow becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. That that Christ just becomes everything in growing measure. And in a way, I, I know who I'm talking to here, and I don't think I'm necessarily saying anything new that you haven't heard before. But I think every so often we ought to be reminded or go back to Scripture and recognize the reason why it ought to be true. And it's all grounded in the fact that Jesus' greatest desire for us is that we would see his glory because he knows that in seeing his glory, that is what frees us. That is what liberates us. That is what gives us life in this world as we await that moment where the vision of his glory that we see now through faith, we one day see with our eyes, where faith becomes sight. It's the gospel. And you might be saying, you know what? I have heard this before. Of course you have. Because it's the gospel. And that's what ought to be the focus and center of our faith. That's what we're about. But sometimes the common becomes commonplace. My hope is that in taking the time we have this week just to to redirect our minds again to what is the goal of the gospel, the glory of Jesus, that it would just blow some fresh wind into your faith, some fresh wind into your walk, that it would remind you of the great treasure you've been given, that it might cause you to repent for where you have ceased to see it as a treasure or treat it as such. 
in allowing other things to become more important. What a sin that is when we pause and stop to recognize and see what the glory of Jesus really is. So God help us. Uh, I want to. I want to end with a um, a prayer. Um, our past. My pastor uh, um, put us on to put me on to this book. It's called The Valley of Vision. It's a it's a Puritan book of prayer, uh, and I think there's lots we can learn from the Puritans. Listen to this prayer on the Spirit's work. O God, the Holy Spirit, take of the things of Christ and show them to my soul. Through thee, may I daily learn more of his love and his grace and his compassion and his faithfulness and his beauty. Let me lead me to the cross and show me his wounds and the hateful nature of evil and the power of Satan. May I see there my sins as the nails that transfixed him, the cords that bound him, the thorns that tore him, the sword that pierced him. Help me to find in his death the reality and immensity of his love. Open for me the wondrous volumes of truth. In his cry, it is finished. Increase my faith in the clear knowledge of the atonement achieved, expiation completed, satisfaction made, guilt done away, my debt paid, my sins forgiven, my person redeemed, my soul saved, hell vanquished, heaven opened, eternity made mine. O Holy Spirit, deepen in me these saving lessons. Write them upon my heart that my walk be sin-loathing, sin-fleeing, Christ-loving. Lord Jesus, you are glorious. We know this is true, and, and I thank you by your grace and through your Spirit that you've allowed us in, in looking into the truth of the gospel, in revealing to us that which is true, that you have by your Spirit given life to our dead souls and our dead bodies and our dead minds and our dead hearts. You have breathed life into us so that we can not only know these things in our minds to be true, but we can taste them. That you have reordered the affections of our hearts so that once again we can desire that which is truly desirable, and that is you. Oh, Jesus, forgive us when our desires are diverted back to the things of this world, those counterfeit glories that are in truth just darkness. Lord Jesus, be merciful. I pray for, for all of us here when that happens. Would you, Holy Spirit, would you captivate us? Would you arrest us where we are? Uh, bring us under conviction and repentance and then steer us back to the fact of your mercy and your grace that you gladly receive us back in with open arms to once again feast upon the great treasure and the bounty that is you. You're not stingy about it. Oh, how you want us to know your glory and to see it and to treasure it and to taste it. And we want to, Jesus, help us want to more. So, Father, I thank you for this week we've had. I thank you that we've been able to, to look into your word. Holy Spirit, thank you for your help to, to open these pages of Scripture. So many of these passages that have been so familiar to so many of us for so long, and yet they never grow old because they are alive, because you speak through them still. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And take us from this week, take us from this place, changed, renewed, and I pray we would go back into this world reflecting the reality of life in your presence, 
of life cherishing and valuing and desiring Jesus above all else. We know that's what the world needs to see. Your people enamored, smitten, completely uh, head over heels and abandoned for you. Jesus, thank you. We pray in your glorious name. Amen. This podcast has been a ministry of Prepared to Answer. Our mission at Prepared to Answer is to help prepare, equip, and encourage the Church of Jesus Christ to grow in confidence of faith by teaching Christians to think like Jesus. To access more resources to help you begin understanding life and the world around you with the mind of Jesus, visit our website at www.preparedtoanswer.org. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at at prepared to answer or contact us directly by email at info at prepared to May the Lord bless and keep you.